Good day. Uh, thanks so much for allowing me to record our conversation today to share with other audiences that might have a similar set of questions or or be looking for uh, some answers uh, re regarding what you're going to be asking us today. Um, before we start, can you introduce yourself to our audience and give a little background of what you're hoping to accomplish with this uh, discussion? Okay, guys. My name is Lefebvre Saboya. I live in Brazil. I'm an instructional designer slash business consultant here. I started, I started in marketing in the 2000s and to do my work well, I, I had to learn about business, how companies work and how products are made and all that stuff. And after that, I started to work in the market here, internal communications, and something was off <laughs> with internal communication in companies. So I had an uncle, he was an engineer, and he introduced me to a little guy called Humbert. Yes. Yes, to help me to learn how man, business work and companies work. And since then, I start to, to work with performance improvement as a scholar. But here in Brazil, there is no, no awareness about it. Uh, it's kind of uh, something people just don't know what it is. Uh, there is only one consulting firm that do something like like it uh, with total manage quality uh, total quality management here in the Falcon mm -hmm. and um, well I <laughs> go to this habit hole <laughs> and here I am talking to you today. Well, all right, so let's just start. So uh, you know, what's your first question? Well, uh, the first question I had is. Um, uh, what's the fundamentals of performance improvement? Uh, uh, here, we don't have the, the culture or the knowledge of uh, improving performance in business. And I really had a hard time, time, hard time, time trying to uh, explain that for people. How can I explain that for the people who are business owners, directors, C level that don't know? what is yeah so i think that uh, so there's a couple of questions in that uh the yeah. first one is the what are the fundamentals or the the basic performance improvement model and so one of the things that i learned uh that, that yeah, i learned this in the late 70s but this comes from the early to mid 1960s from gary rumler whose book you just held up there with the uh, uh, Alan Braish, and uh, uh, but uh, Gary uh, was at the University of Michigan, and uh, another one of the people that I followed and learned from back in the early days of, of my career was a guy named Dale Brethauer. They were both at the University of Michigan, and they created a model, a framework that's very basic. And one of them called it one thing and the other one called it the other. And one day I asked Gary Rumler, why do you guys have two names for the same thing? Who created this? And he said, well, Dale was holding the pen when we were discussing this. And he's the one who put it on the flip chart easel. So, but they, but they both gave it different names. And so Rumler called it the general systems model. And mm -hmm. it's going to be somewhat familiar. It starts with inputs. Then there's a, bo there's a box for inputs and there's a box for process or processes. And there's a box for outputs. And then what's different from most models, uh, process models that are very similar to that, if not exactly the same, is there's a receiving systems after the outputs. So the outputs go someplace. They go to receiving systems was his label for that. And then out of Basically, almost all the boxes were feedback loops and consequence loops. And so the notion here is that if you want outputs that that are acceptable to the receiving systems, 
you need to have a good process that produces good outputs and to have a good process it's got to work with good inputs and so that's their fundamental basic model of how to look at performance and there's more to it than that uh, gary would layer on there's an environment so there's an environment where there's politics and competitors and 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 government regulators and uh, etc so but when you get right down to it you're really trying to produce what Tom Gilbert, who was later Gary Rummer's business partner in the 1970s, what Gilbert called uh, worthy accomplishments, accomplishments that were worth something to the downstream customer and to all the other stakeholders. So, um, and so there's a proliferation of a whole bunch of different kinds of models uh, that try to describe something very similar. I've borrowed from them. I've borrowed models from the total quality management movement, uh, in particular, the Ishikawa diagram, but also other notions that come out of the uh, quality movement, such as the cost of conformance and the cost of non-conformance, which is equivalent to return on investment, if you will, the R and the I in return on investment, uh, something Gilbert called performance improvement potential. So there's a current state performance and there's a desired state. Either some people are performing at a high level, but most people aren't, perhaps. And or there's just we're, we're performing at a certain level, but we have to do better, maybe because of the competitors uh, are doing better than we are or the customers are demanding that we make improvements, whatever the drivers are. We need to look at that model to see, well, we got to have good inputs. We've got to have a good process if we're going to be producing good outputs. And that it behooves us to understand what are the requirements for those outputs. And in my own adaptation of all this, I would also look at what are the stakeholder requirements for the process. Because the customer can love what you're doing, but the regulators may not. They may say you're violating our regulations yeah. in your process. Your output is okay. We don't care about that, or we care about that too. So stakeholders can care about the outputs and or the processes or just one or the other. And the company performing the processes needs to be concerned with the inputs coming in, which are really outputs upstream. So this is kind of a continuous model of, Inputs are processed, become outputs. Those outputs are inputs downstream. And so we can look at performance as a chain of these general systems models, if you will, whatever you, whatever you need to call it. You made a comment earlier about that this is not a, a, a concept that's well known in Brazil. Well, yeah. it's not <laughs> very well known here in the United States either. Um, the total quality management movement and quality concepts and techniques and tools are probably better known than human performance technology or performance technology or performance improvement or human performance improvement. We've got a lot of names sort of basically the same thing, but that's not really well known. And whereas total quality management came out of the quality movement in ma manufacturing to start with generally, yeah. um, human performance technology comes out of the instruction or training or learning field. And what Rummler explained to me back in the 1990s was that it was about in, in 1966, 67, 68, um, where the gurus at NSPI, which is now ISPI, the International Society for Performance Improvement, um, where they realized that they were producing instruction, programmed instruction and other forms of instruction. But, but even if they produced stellar instruction, it was not changing performance well enough or at all. And that caused all the thought leaders who were really into uh, programmed instruction and performance-based 
programmed instruction, trying to improve performance in an enterprise versus education, um, they all realize that there's more to it than knowledge and skills on behalf of the performers. And what where, where Deming, the quality guru, would have said, you know, it's really the system and management is in charge of the system. And so if you've got quality problems, it's due to the system, not to individual performers, not to their knowledge and skills, but it's the entire system. And so systems thinking is really key when you're looking at performance improvement or total quality management. You really got to look at things not in isolation. You need to understand something within its context, within the broader context. So that's a very long answer to uh, a couple of your questions there and i may have missed one of the questions now but uh um any any follow-up or or yeah uh the one of the of humble videos in your site uh, he talks about the problem of car manuf manufacturing with small cars uh, in la late 70s i think uh when the, the japanese companies start to to enter the united states and um, marketing. That's uh, one thing that, that in my early career, here, in my early years, I noticed that marketing tried to ed educate the customer in the United States about the, the advantage and disadvantage of small cars. Till the oil, the oil crisis, uh, when it really changed the, the market. And, yeah, uh, there's, there's, the, there's that whole notion of you know, you need to meet the customer's requirements. You've got to beat the competitors. Yeah. Um, you know, there was a, a famous study done by uh, the MIT about the global automotive industry. And this is where the concept of lean came out of uh, lean manufacturing, because the the Japanese in particular were were beating the big three auto companies here in the United States with their higher quality at lower cost. And so, you know, American companies, you know, knew that they needed to do better. And so they began to look at the, uh, what became the, the Toyota production system, uh, all lean manufacturing concepts, and they tried to make applications of those manufacturing tools and techniques into other parts of the business so that, you know, sales could be lean and uh, general marketing could be lean and HR could be lean, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and there is some application across different functions in an enterprise. Um, I believe, I, you know, I, one of the things that Rumler was doing at Motorola back in the 1980s um, was he was doing lean. And he wasn't calling it lean. They were just calling it streamlining. So they were looking at what's the process. What are, you know, uh, uh, the product in its uh, early uh, iterations before it's the final product goes from one desk to the other. Well, instead of having it go to three different people, why don't you have one person do all three steps yeah. and and shorten the cycle time? And, and he was all about cycle time reduction, which automatically reduces costs. And of course, you, you're you're interested in the quality of what you're doing as well. It's you know so there's quality, quantity, cost metrics, which is basically better, faster, and cheaper. Um, and so what you're always trying to do is improve all three of those if you can. Um, but yeah, there, so there's a long history of this, and in today's world, I think I would hope that performance improvement professionals would be borrowing from the quality of movement. They'd be borrowing from the, you know, the human performance technology. Um, and, and one note about that, the word technology means application of science, doesn't mean computer and digital tools. It means application of science. And that's why human performance technology is the application of science of human performance and you can take out the word human, and it's really the, the technology, the science of improving performance, and not just the human variable, because you might need to improve the computer tools or the data that people are working with or the consequence system. And it's not just all about the human. And so there's a lot of 
misunderstandings, I think, uh, across the board in terms of what is human performance technology, what is human performance improvement, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so move <laughs> to the next question about need analysis <laughs> and getting the data <laughs> that we, uh, we need to create training and instructions to better performance. Here, people think that you will spend a lot of time and, and resources just analyze and with the analysis phase to requirements and stakeholders requirement. And there's a thought they think we will, we will, we will be, uh, we will, will never get out of that phase because you always have to analyze something and you have a lot of that. How much the uh, analysis is needed? Well, I, I think you're Depends. speaking to something that's that's generally known as analysis paralysis. Yes, yes. People that are conducting analysis, if they don't understand their own process, what's the next, what comes after analysis? What do I really need for that step? So in the quality movement, they would call just enough, just in time. I don't need to boil the ocean for a cup of tea. Um, it, that's a quality saying from the 1970s. Um, and the mistake that I see many people in the learning and development field making when they're doing analysis is that they're not sure what they need and what they don't need. And so they go for everything and they get caught up in, in being afraid that they don't have everything that they need. Uh, to me, that's quite silly. Um, I, I break my analysis down into four types. I have a target audience analysis. I have a, pro, a performance analysis. I have enabling knowledge and skill analysis. And then I have an assessment of existing content to see what I can reuse. I mean, when a, when an auto manufacturer produces a new car, they don't go, hey, we need to reinvent batteries. No, we use a battery from the other cars that we use. And we use tires and wheels and brake systems and 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 sound systems and steering wheel, you know. So there's some things that they make changes to, but but you can reuse a lot of parts, and that's one of the things that the American automotive companies learn from their Japanese competitors is reuse of uh, internal components that don't show on the outside. So you may we need to change the fenders and the hood and the trunk of a car uh, to make it look different. But inside, there's a lot of components that are shared with many different cars, and that reduces their costs and improves their quality, et cetera, et cetera. So the, the thing that I think that people need to understand when you're producing training is that you need to be focused on performance and not on a knowledge or a skill or a behavior or a competency. That's what I've lately been calling beginning with the middle in mind. No, you need to begin with the end in mind. And people are performing uh, uh, tasks, employing behaviors and competencies, using various knowledge and skills to produce an output. And so what is that output and how do you know a good one from a bad one? So script writers produce scripts. So how do you know a good script from a bad script? Well, maybe it's when the client reviews it and how they mark it up and change it and all that stuff. Little changes is fine. Big changes, wholesale changes, total rejection of the script. Well, that's no good. So we can define the output and we can define all of the stakeholder stakeholders for that output and determine what are their requirements. Now, as an analyst in instruction, I've been asking master performers what Tom Gilbert called exemplars. Other people call star performers or top performers. Again, it's different labels for the same thing. But I ask them, so when you're done with your tasks and you've produced something, where does it go? So who's the downstream customer? What is it that they're looking for? What do you have to do to make sure that what you've produced meets their requirements? And then we can begin to talk about all the other stakeholders, such as, do the regulators care at all? Well, yes or no is the answer. 
if they do care, well, what do they care about? How do you make sure that you're producing things that the downstream customer likes and the regulators like? And there's other stakeholders as well, and we don't need to go through the whole list of them, but you start with the output of performance because that's an input downstream. And so that's what's key. And so when we take a performance orientation, when when we use a performance orientation to look at instruction, we're trying to train people. We're trying to give them learning that helps them perform but but what perform you know no it's produce outputs that meet those requirements of the stakeholders they perform tasks we can identify what are the behavioral tasks yeah. those things that we can see what are the cognitive tasks the thinking tasks that we cannot see you know what is guy thinking when he's doing that well we need to find out we need to have ways of doing it that's the most difficult kind of task analysis cognitive task analysis to do but we have to understand the overt behavioral tasks that we can see and we can measure and we can count them. We need to have a way to derive um, and determine what are the cognitive tasks? What are people thinking before, during, and after they're doing those behavioral tasks? Then once we know what are all the tasks that are necessary to produce an output, we can begin to systematically derive what are the enabling knowledge and skills. What do you got to know in order to be able to do? And that to do is to produce something of value. And so we can get all caught and then we can, we can look at it. So we can understand that in a simple sense. And then we can ask about, well, is that rote performance? Is that the way they do it each and every time? Or are there times when they have to vary? You know, because maybe the they're working outside and the weather is, you know, snowy or rainy or too hot or whatever. So what what variances are there in the performance context? Once we understand the basics, what are the variances? Maybe the customer wants something different this time. And that would cause us to perform tasks slightly differently. And that might require different inputs to our task performance. And it might require that the output is slightly different. So the, so once we establish kind of a baseline for what is the performance, then we can begin to look at what are the variances that we need to prepare the learner who is a performer, what do we need to yes. prepare them to do? Is it the same time each and every time, rote performance, or is there variation? Situa- and we need to prepare them to be situationally aware, to recognize that they need to change a little bit this time, and we need to teach them how to do so. Yeah. I uh, Just to, uh, to make clear for the, for people, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, <laughs> we, we don't decide those, those, those things. It's the master performers, master perform, performers, that analyze the problem and tell 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 us what to do. We just kind of help them to make it clear, take out of the the back end of their, their minds, something like that. Yeah, well, that I, that is that is hard to do. And you know, my one of the things is I learned a long time ago. That if I work with a group of master performers and other subject matter experts, we have a tendency to call them subject matter experts. But I don't want mm-hmm. people who know a lot. I want people who can do the job because <laughs> I got to start with yeah. doing the job well. So I want the top people, the master performers, whatever language is appropriate. Yeah. And I and I want them to help me. And I if I get a group of them together in a room, nowadays we would do that virtually. But when mm-hmm. I had them all together in a room, they would correct each other. Oh, hey, yeah. you, you said there's three steps. There's actually five in between steps one and two. Don't you also do this? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So we're dealing with people who have automated. Everybody does. Everybody automates about 70% of what they do. Yeah. They don't even think about it. They can just do it because they're on autopilot. And, and that's what's tricky about getting the cognitive tasks because... People are better at, at expressing their behavioral tasks, their, the, the things that are obvious, that are overt. But the things that are covert, they're thinking, they've automated most of that. And, and therefore, they can't tell us. 
Um, yeah. We can insist that they tell us, but they can't because they cannot recall it. They've automated it. They can do it, but they can't tell us about it. So when you're dealing with interviewing people one at a time, people, you know, person A says something, then person B says something. There's a little bit of overlap, but some difference. Well, you need to go back to person A and said, hey, B said this. Is that true? And they'll think about it and they may say, oh, yeah. And, and that stimulates their thinking. And they may recall something else. So Dr. Richard E. Clark, Dick Clark, um, a professor emeritus at uh, Southern California University, has been looking at this cognitive task analysis, CTA, for about 25 years now. And he says that people... Uh, all of us, basically, but when you're dealing with experts, experts will have automated 70% of what a novice needs to know, and they can't share that with you. So you have to use talk to more than one expert. And he says about five is the number, and that'll get you to a higher percentage up in the 80% of what a novice needs. Um, and then through use and continuous improvement, you can backfill and get it closer to the 100%, or people will go from formal learning into informal learning, and they'll figure out that missing percentage themselves while they're trying to do the work. Yeah. Uh, so let's go to the next question. It's okay. all interconnected. Yes. Uh, uh, here in Brazil, we have a, um, a, we like to, to produce good content, so, uh, something that came from marketing. We need a great video, a great uh, a well diagrammation, uh, a book or a book with a good font, very beautiful. But we don't do. I, I think. Some some solutions could be a job aid, for example, to people. I had a lot of thing, uh, works like that in the banking that we, I, people want a course, but a job aid was enough to improve performance of uh, I don't know a mortgage uh, uh, process, for example, in, in the branch branches. Uh, can you tell me about uh, the, uh, what, what uh, how uh, focus fo uh, you give too much importance to content and uh, improve or don't in the performance in the uh, without practice? Uh, there's something that you yeah. really do uh, demo. Well, so uh, uh, when I first started back in 1979, I was given an article by Rumler and Gilbert called Guidance, The Short Way Home. And it was about what was then known as job aids. Guidance, job aids, now it's performance support or workflow learning. But it's basically giving you step-by-step -step instructions or giving you a set of questions to come up with the answers and that would guide your performance. And I was told by my brand new boss who had been in the company, I, I joined on date, you know, my first day was my boss's uh, uh, second, third week and I had a peer, and it was her third week as well. Mm -hmm. And they told me that we were going to do this guidance job aid stuff, and we were not going to do training. Well, our clients hated it. And so we did sneaky trick number 17 in that we embedded, we created job aids and embedded them in traditional training. Now, later on, the client said, well, maybe we don't need this training stuff. We could just use one of those, what do you call it, job aids? And we said, oh, sure, we can do that. But but so we're dealing with the mindset of our customers, the learners, their management, your internal client, and everybody is generally thinking about education. They've all experienced the education system. You, you read, you, you get lectures, you learn things, you get tests. That's what yeah. most people think of as training. Well, that's not necessarily good training. It's necessary, but it's insufficient. And so we're always struggling, I think, with giving people what they need, but we also have to deal with what they want, what they expect. And a lot of times 
uh, my take on this was that clients would hear somebody saying, well, you don't need training, you need a job aid. And then they would think that, well, you guys don't want to do your job. You're in the training department. Now it's learning, but you're in the training department. Why don't you want to produce training? Well, we're trying to give you the, the most effective. If I can give somebody a piece of paper and they can then go do the job, that's better than them sitting through a two-hour module yeah. going away for a two-hour or all-day-long course if it would could be that simple. But people aren't used to that. So you have to introduce this slowly to them and get them to see, have it become their idea that they don't need the training or the learning, the two-hour module. They just need something online on somebody's phone that gives them the 17 steps and then the people can do it. So the other the other part of this is that a lot of clients believe that every everyone needs to memorize everything. And that's simply not true. In many of the jobs that I've had outside of the uh, learning and development profession, um, much of my performance could have been guided by a job aid that I could refer to when I needed it. I didn't have to have it memorized, especially things that you don't use very often, because that's expensive to maintain guys' memorization of things that he doesn't use often enough. If I learn something and go to the job and I use it every day, all day long, I'm going to memorize it. But if there's something that I'm going to use maybe once a month, once a quarter, I'm most likely not going to memorize that. And so you then have to use spaced learning or reinforcement learning, whatever people call it, to keep that in my memory. And that's expensive to do. And it distracts from me doing my job because I've got to spend all this time trying to rememorize something that I had remembered, but then I forgot it. And, and so clients eventually can come to those decisions themselves once they see it, once they experience it. So mm -hmm. I, I would always recommend to people, if your clients don't like the idea of job aids, don't talk about it. Just do it. Put it in the training. Let people have that and start using it. And eventually the client will have a bright idea such as, we don't really need to have that training or that learning. We could just give them these reference materials, these resources. Yeah. Uh, the, I, I think in the uh, video, the Hackman's video in your site, uh, they, they talk about the drop of performance after the a, a good training. After that, when you are still learning how to use what you learn. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, we see uh, here in Brazil, uh, our metric is our, our engagement, stats, score tests, something like that. Just to avoid that little, little, little drop in the performance. <laughs> so, I mean, that's generally true for most things that people learn is that when they first start off doing it, their performance might even be worse than before they were trained because they're trying something new and different and they've got to get a feel for it and, and make it work. And so performance can degradate, go down, when you were hoping that it goes up and clients sometimes freak out about that, they go, oh my goodness, that's no good. Well, you got to give them, that's why in training, we should include more practice with feedback. So people are learning and mastering something in the training, in the learning context and not back on the job. And not everything is necessary um, it depends on, you know, what did the learner already know? What have they experienced? Is this all brand new to them or is this fairly familiar? And now we're just giving them something that's slightly different, but asking them to apply that slightly different thing in their performance. Um, if it's brand new to some people, but, you know, familiar to other people, you're going to get that difference here where, where people will master it at a different pace. I don't think it, people should be scared of this dropping in performance because when you learn to ride a bike, <laughs> the first or second thing you do <laughs> is try to jump from the sidewalk to the street <laughs> and you probably fall. I have my 
my own scars of, of that. But it's normal of you how you learn stuff. Yeah. Um, you learn to perform well. You have to fall sometimes and do something wrong or bad. We can minimize the risks of uh, uh, about it, but and it's and it's good to that. to share that with your client and the other stakeholders and relate it to something that would be familiar to them, such as you know if they ever taught their you know a teenager how to drive. You know, mm -hmm. there's a learning curve there. There's a performance curve and people need time to practice with feedback. And if you're not going to allow us to include that in the learning program, then it's going to happen outside the learning program. And what Neil Rackham talked about in that video that you referenced mm -hmm. is that, you know, people will try something and if it doesn't work, they will give up and they'll go back to the way they used to always do it and so yeah. maintenance of behavior maintenance of these new knowledge and skills maintenance of the new performance is critical and either again we put that into the learning package and include it there but we also have to know that when people get back out on the job they're going to still be learning as they're doing something new and different and We've got to be wary about supervisors watching Guy perform and struggling a little bit. And then the supervisor might say, Guy, do it the old way. Well, then all, yeah. the, all the investment in learning is for naught because we've given up on it. So sometimes we have to prepare the supervisor for this learning and performance curve so that they expect that Guy might struggle a little bit. He may need some encouragement. He may need some reinforcing feedback and some corrective feedback to help Guy master this new thing. And when we, I've learned that when I've talked with clients about this, when meeting with them, they understand this in their own world, in their own lives, but in but what we're talking about, they may not anticipate that and expect that in this learning that we're doing. So again, it depends on what are people learning, how familiar is it or unfamiliar is it, and what is it that it's going to take for people to really get comfortable with their own mastery, with their own competence. And that's something that that's the part of the partnership between a learning professional and the client, and in particular, the learner's management. They, We all need to be working in concert to make sure that what is learned is valid and that it transfers out into the job and that it sticks. Because yeah. it may be that the old way, which isn't as good, is much quicker and easier. And so... Yeah. People can do the new thing for a while, but then they might revert because to do something quicker and, and you need you need the local management and supervision or my peers who I'm working with for them to watch out for that and, and not let me backslide. And so to maintain that is going to be a collaborative effort of the learning professionals, the managers of the learners, and perhaps even the people that work in the processes with that learner, they may need to know that guys learn some new way to do something and we're going to have to give him a, a a while to master that. And so he may take a little bit longer initially, but eventually he'll get better and faster and cheaper. And, and, and so that's what we need. So it's performance is complex, unless, of course, it's very simple and very rote. But the more variables there are in the real world performance context, the tougher it's going to be for a learning professional to package learning in such a way and reinforcement learning and learning for the other process people, supervisors, peers, customers even sometimes need to learn that this is going to be a little bit different. Yeah. The, if you come back, uh, you, you're talking about the feedback loop. With, with the outputs and the inputs. If the managers don't understand the new process yeah. and, get, and turn back to the old ways, you will never see uh, good results in the, yeah. in, in the output. That is so, 
it, that's my final question. How we measure impact beyond those engaging metrics or score tests? How do you you give advice for somebody who is starting to perform an improvement to measure it? Yeah, so it, yeah, it, got, it kind of goes back to that general systems model of, of uh, yeah. Rumler and breath hours. Um, so either the task performance, the process box, and the output box, uh, how is that measured in the real world? Now, those measurement systems may be in place already by the customer, by the target audience's management and their and their functional uh, group. Um, you know, we measure sales all, all the time, all every which way. Um, but there's a lot of things that aren't measured specifically, and that's what we might be targeting with our training or our learning. And so we may have to, once we do our analysis and we understand what are the outputs produced, what's the process, we can begin to ask questions about quality, quantity, and cost. What's it cost you right now? How long does it take? What kind of quality do you have? I mean, does every one of those outputs good or do you only have an 80% yield where 20% of them aren't good enough? So we need to establish what the baselines are when we're out there doing our initial analysis. And then when we go to do evaluation, we're looking at the same numbers. Did we improve that? Did yield go from 80% mm -hmm. to 92%? Well, that's good. Why isn't it 100? Well, there may be more variables than we can contend with. Yeah. Uh, what does it cost you to produce these outputs, one at a time or in dozens or whatever? Um, and so we're, we're looking at whatever the real world measures are that the client would use. They may not have put in formal measurement mechanisms. They may not know what the baseline numbers are when we start our projects with them, we need to go find that out in analysis because that establishes the baseline. And then we can compare and contrast the baseline numbers with the post training numbers. Now, so that, you know, should we measure engagement? Yeah, sometimes. I don't know if I'm gonna teach somebody how to repack a valve on an oil pipeline, I don't need to make that training engaging. Those people know they got to learn how to do that and do that well. Otherwise, they're going to get in trouble. So they're motivated and they'll learn it. Does it have to be fun? Probably not. Um, I think we we default to things like engagement and is it fun when we're not focused on performance, when we're teaching something that's not near transfer, but far transfer. And because it's not always easy to see, I'm learning this, but how do I apply this? Well, if it wasn't designed and developed to be authentic in terms of the application, we're trying to teach too many people, you know, one size fits all, then we then we can't measure performance because there's too many different performances where this is applicable and and nobody's going to take the time and trouble and expense to make all those measurements to determine it in the first place. So we we begin with the middle in mind and we teach people active listening as if you know it's the same for everybody well it's not yeah. do people everybody do, uses active listening yeah. but but is the context you know sometimes you're getting a customer complaint and they're angry sometimes it's in the sales contest where the where the customer wants to buy something and and you just need to make sure that what you're selling them is the right thing for their need those are two different contexts and and how you master active listening in those two different contexts is different. But too often we're doing one size fits all kind of training and learning content and we don't measure. But but when we're when we're going to measure, when we're focused on performance, we can measure that performance before and after the learning intervention. And we shouldn't measure immediately after the learning occurred because of what Rackham taught us about, you know, the sure. the, the performance is going to deteriorate slightly from probably the past before it gets better and better and better as people climb the continuous learning and and performance curves as they do it more and more often and they learn how to do it better and faster um because that's what we want so maybe you don't measure you know day one back on the job maybe you wait until 
if they've been out there for a week or two or a month or two or three months out, if you were able to make those measurements, you know, one month out, two month out, three month out, you should see uh, an improvement until people reach the peak of what is, you know, probable for them in terms of how well they can perform. Yeah, uh, some uh, especially in training, actively listen. Uh, it's something that uh, it's strange because you don't uh, you want to learn about the learners, what their needs. Uh, but uh, I always uh, find that the learners have fear of the stuff they will learn, especially because of this that performance drip or because the managers uh, won't like it, uh, because it's easier to do the, the old way. They just, we always did that. There, yeah, there's like a, that, so we, why change? So Yeah, so when people are feel that they're confident enough yeah. in doing it the current way, when you try to teach me some new way of doing it, my fear is that I will not look competent doing it your way when I know I can look competent doing it my way. And so sure. we have to overcome that barrier. We have to build in our learning process, event or chain of events, we have to build the learner's competence and confidence so that they can go back to the job and apply it and even maybe struggle with it, but learn to master it after the formal training in their informal learning back on the job. And the, people are fearful of that. So, um, so one of the barriers to overcome is we, at the very beginning of a learning experience, we need people to understand what they're going to go through, how they're going to learn it, and how we're going to give them sufficient practice with feedback so that they will have the competence and confidence at the end of the learning to go back to the job and be successful. But, but, but new hires don't know anything. So, you know, they're, we're not competing with, with a new thing, with the old thing, but with incumbents, employees, they probably already have some way of doing something and they may be a bit resistant to start unless we can show them, well, here's a couple of examples where, you know, guy learned something and he's now doing it, you know, at this speed, at this quality level. And, you know, what are you in the audience here? What, how fast are you doing this? What's your quality thing? What, so what are, so we're, we're trying to help people see that, oh, this has potential to help me do it better, faster and cheaper. And that would be a good thing. Now I've got to have confidence and I've got to see that the content, the information, the demonstration and the application exercises, the practice with feedback, are going to enable me to learn and master this and not embarrass myself back on the job. If I'm going to embarrass myself, it's better to embarrass myself in the learning experience yeah. than back on the job. But then again, I don't necessarily want to embarrass myself ever, even in a learning experience, because there's other peers who might be here and involved, and they may see, well, guy's not so hot anyhow. He, you know, he's struggling with this. Yeah. So we've always got to be careful about making sure that the learning environment is a safe environment. And that means we need to understand that target audience in terms of what do we expect them? Are they, is this going to be so radically new and different, or is this going to be somewhat familiar? So where, you know, where's the starting point for the learners compared to where we want to get them and how do we structure our learning experiences so that people can climb that learning curve and performance curves and get better and better without embarrassing themselves. And one of the mechanisms that I use is, and I tell my clients this from the very beginning, you know, one and done practice with feedback or exercises is seldom sufficient. And so when mm -hmm. I design your training, we're going to have multiple uh, practice exercises for people. You know, we're going to start off fairly easy. Then we're going to make it more difficult. Then we're going to make it damn difficult from Hades. 
And it's the worst case scenario because that's what people need to be prepared for back on the job is the worst case scenario, but we can't throw them into the deep end of the pool when we're teaching them swimming. Yeah. We need to start off in the shallow end, then work yeah. in the middle of the pool and then go to the deep end. And, and clients normally understand that they may not like it. They go, well, that's going to take too long. Well, if we don't take that long and make that investment, what's the worst that can happen? Are you know people going to go back out on the do- uh, back on the job and be incompetent and and kill other people, maim other people, destroy the company's reputation? You know what's the worst that can happen? And so that's the cost of nonconformance. Yeah. And so that's what we're trying to avoid. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's true. Uh, now to the last question. Uh, that's uh, something I think I now. Uh, I try. I talk with a lot of people in training and instructional designers here in Brazil. Uh, most of them tell to me, "We can't do impro- uh, performance improvement without a team. I can't do that by my own." Uh, I think, well, maybe you can if at least start to think with this mindset of performance. Then, then, then do the pivot points. I, I, well, I think that, yeah. So I think that you know, you know, people are afraid to start, but I wouldn't label it. I wouldn't just say, you know, hey, we're going to do performance improvement here. Or yeah. Orientation. No, just do it. Just sneak it into place. Just do your thing differently, and always keep in mind what are we? We're we're training people. We're hoping that they learn to do what, and what do they produce. And so how do I put that into place? Now, the struggle will come when your client asks you to do one size fits all. We want people yeah. to learn this new behavior and we're going to have the same training, same learning on a behavior for everybody. Well, what I've learned to do when I've been in that situation and talking with my clients is that, all right, so we're going to teach people this new behavior and then we're going to have them design their own practice with feedback because their application of that behavior is different than the person next to them. So I don't need to learn somebody else's job. I need to learn my job. So part of the training and learning, uh, and this is, this isn't easy necessarily, right? Because you can't put it in an e-learning package where a guy is now going, you could, I mean, but it might be too expensive. Guy is going to construct his own practice with feedback. So, and then he's going to do the practice and get the feedback. So uh, again, a, a novice performer, somebody who's not had the job, they don't even necessarily know what the application is of this behavior. Incumbents will know how, where this fits, how this is supposed to fit into their world of work. But And so this is, this is the trap. When we don't have people practice something, it's like learning to drive. You wouldn't tell your teenager well you've watched me drive you know you're 16 years old you've been watching me drive for 16 years here's the keys go for it <laughs> yeah no 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 that's too that dangerous there's story. too much risk um you know if you're going to say here here rake the lawn with a rake and rake up all the leaves you know there's no danger in that you know you've seen me do this you go do it you know? <laughs> and eventually you'll figure it out so it's a time and a yeah. place to to orient uh the learning to particular performance and there's a and there's a way to just embed the performance orientation into the content um you don't need to ask for permission because you may not get it so you just want to be sneaky about it and yeah. embed the performance aspects what are the what are people what are we teaching people to know what skills will that lead to? What tasks will they be able to perform? And what outputs will they produce? And how do you know a good output from a bad one? Who are the stakeholders? What is it that they are insistent on and demanding? Those are the requirements. We have to teach people how to meet those performance requirements of their stakeholders. And, and you don't have to boil the ocean for a cup of tea. You can get several master performers together or go make observations and then do interviews and get the right content in place. Give people the minimal amount of information. Give them 
a demonstration of what that looks like when you apply it. And then basically the demonstration should reflect the application exercise, the practice. So I'm going to tell you, I'm going to show you. Now you show me back and you do it too. And what I was taught is that we always backward design and backward develop. We start with the application exercise. The application exercise could be the test. Can they do it? Well, the practice and, and the test are could be very much the same. So we begin with building the practice with feedback or the test. Then we decide whether we need to show people what that looks like. If there are a bunch of incumbents, they already know what that looks like. They don't need a demonstration. Um, and then we can give people the minimal information. We can eliminate the extraneous information and focus on the essential information that people need, the minimal. If we don't have performance in mind, then it's quite arbitrary whether we need to include A, B, and C, and D, because maybe we don't need C and D. Maybe that's not really absolutely required. You just need to know A and B. Here's what that looks like. Now practice it. But but sometimes if you're thinking about this uh, uh, like a subject matter expert, well, they've learned a lot. Subject matter experts have learned a lot, and they want to put everything in to your learning program because they're afraid to leave something out. And they don't know how to make a decision as to whether it's absolutely necessary or not. Um, and it may be that they've learned things that will come up every 40 years, but now no more often than that. And so they want to put that in your content as well. Well, that just adds to the cognitive load of the learners, which yeah. means they won't learn very much. And so our job is to strip that out. So when you begin with the end in mind and you design the practice exercise, and the demonstration, what information is necessary so people understand the demonstration and then will be successful in the practice exercises. They may not need topic C and D in order for that to happen. Um, and, and that way we serve our learners and all of our stakeholders better because we're giving the minimal instruction that will lead to improved performance. And loading people up with a bunch of content where they don't practice it, that's a content dump. And that may be what's necessary in education. You know, what about history? What is what is essential yeah. in a history course for people to really know? That's much more arbitrary than in a science or math course. And it's very arbitrary compared to what we need to teach people how to be proficient in their jobs back on the job. Yeah, uh, I really, I already, I already told you this. I don't have people to talk about performance improvement here in Brazil. So I sneak performance improvement in all my work for the last 20 years. And sometimes uh, people ask me, how do you do it? And sometimes I try to explain and people just don't believe. One, once a time, a boss of mine think that I'm... Uh, I don't uh, if I don't want to teach them the the team to do thing to do things. I have a silver bullet or something like that, and he's got very angry with me. No, no, I just did that. It was a uh, implementation of job aids. And uh, no, I just put the job aids. I changed the formatting. And that's it. Yeah. No, you need something. You need to tell me what you did. Come on. Yeah. It. I mean, it. It can seem. The results can be very <laughs> impressive, and people will tend to think of it as being much more complicated than it really needs to be. It doesn't yeah. have to be a secret. It doesn't have to be something that other people can't master. Um, you know, one of the books that I was given on my first day on the job was uh, a book by Bob Mager, Robert F. Mager, and Peter Pipe on analyzing performance problems. And I read it. I was I had just moved, and I uh, my family hadn't caught up to me. And yeah, and uh, and so that, that <laughs> I got it. Was, that book was very meaningful to me. And there's some good examples, and it's been a long time since I've read that. And I've, I've read it two or three times over the past 41 years, 43 years. And and so there are things that you can extract from that book to share with your client. 
there's that flow chart of that they have for analyzing a performance problem to determine whether knowledge and skills are going to solve that performance problem or not. And so when a client comes to you with a request and it's because they're pe- they have people that aren't that are they have a performance issue, a problem or an opportunity, uh, it may not be knowledge and skills. And that's where the performance improvement consulting or performance consulting comes in. Our clients may really want performance improved. They but they come to us because they don't know where else to go. And we're going to produce some content. And that's maybe not what they need at all. Or maybe they need that content plus several other things to be fixed in order to get their performance improvement. That's why it's important, I think, for the analysts and the project planners and the L&D leaders to understand performance is much more than knowledge and skills. And when our clients come to us for new hires, yeah, we give them the 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 training, the learning that they need as a new hire. But when the the cause for them coming to us with a request is not new hires, it's we've got problems and we want to solve them, we can conduct our analysis and help them quickly determine what's at the root. Is it knowledge and yeah. skills that are deficient or are there other variables, uh, other enablers in that performance context that need to be addressed? Because you're not going to fix bad data with good training. You're not going to fix a bad consequence system that actually rewards people for taking safety shortcuts. Yeah. You're not, you know, you, the learning is not going to affect that. Learning may be necessary, but it may not be sufficient. And that's the value add that we can have with our clients. It's just that we can't get embroiled in analysis paralysis. We've got to have a way to do this quickly. We've got to know what data do we need now for our next steps and what data can we get later. If we don't have a process that's rigorous, as rigorous as required and as flexible as feasible, then we might try to gather all the data that we need right now when we could have gotten some of it later. Yeah. And and the clients have seen, I, I used to complain about this back in the early 80s. I saw analysis reports with a whole bunch of data in it that was never, ever used after the report. And when I created my own methodology, my, mm-hmm. my goal was to strip all of that out get only what I needed. So I had to backwards engineer my own development process so that I could decide what do I need right here, right now, for sure, get that reviewed and approved, and then use it and generate new data using the old data. I didn't have to have it all up in the analysis phase. That's one of my books from 2020, is is conducting analysis in each and every phase in my project planning and kickoff phase where I do intake of the request and I do a project plan and I review that with the client, I'm doing analysis in that phase. That leads to the analysis phase where I'm doing analysis in the analysis phase, but then that leads to design and I'm doing analysis in the design phase and I'm doing analysis in the development phase. And then I've extracted pilot testing out of development to make it put an emphasis on that. When I'm doing my pilot testing, I'm doing analysis then as well. And yeah. so because I didn't feel a need to do that all up front and then be afraid that if I don't get what I need, I won't have it when I need it. And 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 so there the it depends on what is the process that's in place for doing instructional development or learning development. And too often there is no process. I, I liken it to, you know, you're either running your L&D function like an engineering organization or you're running it like an artist colony and artists are doing their own thing, their own way, and there's no control. It's not predictable in terms of quality, cost, yeah. or schedule. And we need some middle ground there that leans more towards the engineering side of things than the art artist side of things. Yeah, um, uh, people uh, sometimes people think Lefebvre is so all you need is that you need something else, and I always re- uh, reply, Yes, I will need more stuff. 
What? I still don't know. <laughs> I will find out. Then I go back to you. Because uh, you have you 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 don't you will be facing other challenges, challenges and problems in, in, uh, in development of the project. You don't know can be good problems, good solutions or not, but you have to wait to see where you're going to end up with uh, until the final, final implementation. Guy, I wanted to thank you for taking the time to, to talk with me. Thank you very much. Wow, <laughs> this was helpful, and I hope that you yes. can do what you indicated in that earlier communication here, is that help people in Brazil and in all of South America to look at learning as an opportunity to help people improve their performance. Sometimes it's, you know, all they need is an educational approach, but sometimes yeah. they need this enterprise learning approach where you're really trying to impact specific performance, not by giving people generic content, educational content, but by giving them training that will help people master specific tasks to produce specific outputs that will meet those requirements. And so I wish you uh, luck in doing this. Um, Thank you. I wouldn't necessarily uh, label everything. I would just deal with clients and do things this in a performance orientation and make those improvements. But but calling it, labeling it creates problems sometimes. And uh, you had asked another question here. I wanted to answer this one is that, <laughs> You asked me about certifications. Oh, yes. I forgot that. And and so ISPI has a certification, the Certified Performance Technologist, somebody who yes. can apply the science. And I held that for a number of years. Um, but it's not very well known. And I, I think it's a extremely uh, good certification because you have proven through doing things, applying these things, before you can get the certification, it's not just a knowledge test. It's did you do things and will clients attest to that? But 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 it's not very well known. And you had asked me about that versus the Lean Six Sigma kinds of certifications. Yeah. And I think that depending on your marketplace, Lean and Six Sigma certifications are going to carry much more weight. And what you're really trying to do is establish and build the client's confidence in your abilities. And if they understand what Lean and Six Sigma is, they're more likely to appreciate that kind of a certification than CPT, which it's it's unlikely, it's not likely that they'll know what the heck that is. But if they think that you are have mastered to some level Lean and Six Sigma, mm -hmm. then I think that in your marketplace, that may be the better thing to do. And in fact, Many of my friends and colleagues from the 80s, you know, Motorola created Six Sigma and they used Gary Rumler's intellectual property when they created Six Sigma. So Six Sigma has a Rumler root to it. And, and Rumler was doing lean, as I talked about earlier. Um, if you can apply lean and Six Sigma to help improve processes, well, that doesn't deal with instruction or learning, but you can bring all of that to bear. You can use those same tools and techniques, which may be more familiar to your prospects and your clients. And so it's a tough decision, but I would say that all of my friends who, who left HPT back in the 80s and mm -hmm. when it got Lean and Six Sigma certified, they have a different kind of clientele. They are doing performance improvement work people who are in the learning profession who have tried to enter performance improvement through that route, they're, they're, the clients and prospects, they don't understand, you know, well, that's learning, that's education, that's training. But Lean and Six Sigma might have a better pull for you. So I think you need to look at that and I think that there's a lot of overlap between human performance technology and total quality management. In fact, yeah. my former business partners and I wrote a book back in 1994. That's when it was published. It was written in 93. But uh, the, uh, the, the quality roadmap. 
And it was our version of applying both TQM and HPT. That's how we approached our business. And that's the services that we offered to our marketplace uh, was that approach to improving performance. So I, I think it's a, it's a, it was a good question. And I wanted to make sure that we kind of covered that because while I do value the CPT, it just doesn't, it's just not known by most of the world. And, but Lean and Six Sigma is much more well known, not universally, but much more well known than CPT. Yeah. And like a Sequoia Club, <laughs> Justice League. <laughs> so, uh, Mas, uh, thank you for your, for your advice, Guy. I really appreciate it. All right. Well, you're, you're most welcome and good luck to you. Thank you. All right. Cheers. Cheers. Good job.